So I'd like to th uh, thank Dr. Rashizan for inviting me to talk to you guys today. I'm looking forward to the poster session this afternoon and learning about some of the research that you all have been doing at LSU this summer. So I'm an evolutionary biologist by training, and I'm interested broadly in the processes that create and maintain biodiversity. And I focus almost exclusively on marine ecosystems, and I work with marine invertebrates. So one of the questions that I'm working on for my postdoc is trying to understand how species interact with their environment. So this is a picture of the rocky intertidal from the west coast of North America. And I've got um, a representative species here. This is Pisaster sea star, and one of the species that occurs here. So these organisms have to deal with a really harsh environment. They have pounding wave action. There's changes in salinity, temperature. When the tide goes out, they're exposed to the air, so they have to deal with desiccation stress. And so most of the animals that live here are kind of locally adapted to their particular environment. One of the other questions I'm interested in is how species interact with each other. And in this example, I'm showing a, a goby fish and its shrimp partner. So these guys, these guys pair up early in life. They stay together for life. And they have this really nice mutualism. So the shrimp builds a burrow in the sand. He's constantly digging it out and cleaning it and keeping it nice. The fish lives in the burrow with the shrimp. And the, because the shrimp is blind, the shrimp or the fish acts kind of as the bodyguard. So the shrimp maintains the burrow, the fish scares away predators, and they both benefit from this relationship. There are a lot of cool YouTube videos about this online if you ever want to look them up. Um, but not all relationships or interactions are mutually beneficial. So in this example, there's I'm showing a marine snail preying on an octocoral sea fan. So this would be an example of a predator-prey interaction. And you can see as the snail is moving across, it's eating the tissue away from the coral. So we can use data from the transcriptome to help us answer questions about how species interact with each other and with their environment. And the transcriptome is basically all of the RNA molecules, so your messenger RNA, tRNA, ribosomal RNA, that are produced by a cell or a tissue at any given time. And this can change, so it's dynamic. We may have genes that are transcribed or expressed throughout life. You could have genes that are only expressed during specific developmental phases or when an organism is under stress from its environment. So the two projects that I'm working on in the Kelly Lab right now are trying to understand the basic, uh, the genomic basis, basis of salinity tolerance in T. gryopis copepods. And the second is to understand the effects of ocean acidification on a sponge coral species interaction. And I'm using some uh, different kinds of experiments to get at these questions, and, and I'm also using transcriptomic data. I'm also going to talk a little bit about the way data collection and analysis has changed in the last five or six years since I've been at LSU. And I'm going to end with a little bit of information about my particular career path and what it's like to be a postdoc in biological sciences. So this is T. griopis californicus, the copepod that I'm working on in the Kelly lab. It's a small intertidal species that lives in tide pools. This is a female. She's got a big egg sac here. And she's got one little red eye at the top of her head. They're pretty small, about two to three millimeters. Um, and most of the work we do with them is under a light microscope. So this was taken under magnification. This is uh, a picture of one of the locations from which I've sampled these critters. So this is uh, north of the Dega Bay, north of San Francisco, off the coast of California. And you can see it's really rocky. There's some tide pools here in the foreground of the picture. They're pretty small, shallow pools. So they um, dry up pretty easily. The conditions in those pools become hypersaline, really warm. Then they'll get replenished by rain or a wave. So these T. griopis copepods have to deal with a lot of stressful situations. These are uh, two of the sampling locations that I'm working with on this project, one in the north at Salt Point, one in the south in San Diego. And then this is kind of the coast of North America here into Baja uh, Peninsula. And so one of the cool things about T. griopis is the distribution of temperatures in which they occur. So the map here is showing um, the sea surface temperature, where the darker blue colors are colder colors, or colder temperatures, and the red, oranges, and yellows um, are the warmer temperatures. So this species occurs from Alaska all the way down into Mexico, and it, it occurs in, across this huge range of temperatures. 
They're really easy to keep in the lab. They're kind of like the Drosophila equivalent in the marine world. So this is a picture of the incubator in our lab space. They hang out in these little jelly containers quite happily. We can keep different colonies from different populations going. They're easy to um, mate with each other. They've got a short generation time. So we can do breeding experiments and look at how populations evolve. Um, we can also expose them to different treatments in the lab and see how they respond. So these are the three more specific questions that I'm looking at in my research. How do populations differ in salinity tolerance? Are there differences in gene expression among populations? And if there are differentially expressed genes, what is the function of those genes? So to get at these questions, I've taken a couple different approaches. The first is a fecundity experiment. So I've taken 10 females per population per salinity, and I've basically reared them in different salinities. So 35 ppp is kind of your typical seawater, and then 50 is higher, and 15 is bracket. So I counted the number of larvae produced by each female in these treatments. The second thing I did was a knockdown experiment, where I basically wanted to figure out what salinity causes a 50% mortality rate in a population. So I took eight copepods per population, uh, per salinity, for eight different salinities, and I just monitored them to see uh, what the mortality levels were. And then for gene expression, this is kind of the bulk of the data that I'm analyzing now. Um, each one of these circles represents a replicate, and within each circle I pooled 50 copepod individuals. The blue circles represent northern populations, uh, the orange represent the south, and then I've got my three different salinity treatments. So I put the copepods into their treatment, I waited an hour, and then I flash froze them in liquid nitrogen and extracted all the RNA so I could see how gene expression was changing depending on the treatment. And to get right into some results, here I found that the northern copepods had greater fecundity or produced more offspring at low and high salinity. So I've got salinity on the x-axis here, average number of offspring produced here on the y, and you can see at 35, which is kind of the ambient control salinity, there's, there's no difference between populations. But if you look at the high and the low salinity, the north is producing more offspring at these kind of stressful um, salinities. The northern population also had greater tolerance to salinity in terms of their 50% knockdown level. So here we've got north and south, and this is the 50% knockdown salinity. So for the northern populations, I had to raise the salinity to 90, which is almost three times the strength of seawater to see a 50% mortality effect. But in the south, I was able to achieve that at only about 75. And then for the transcriptomic data, um, this is a multidimensional scaling plot, which basically takes the tens of thousands of data or tens of thousands of genes that I have data for and kind of summarizes it by showing how the treatments are related to each other. So each dot represents a particular treatment, and the colors are over here. The blue is the north, the orange is the south, and as the color kind of gets more intense, that's indicating the salinity is getting higher. So the first thing we can notice is that there's a big difference between populations. All of the northern treatments cluster here, the southern treatments cluster over here. So we have differences between population and how they're responding to salinity, regardless of whether it's high, medium, or low. And then the other kind of cool thing to pull out of this is that these dots here, um, these three dots represent the kind of ambient control salinity for the north. And then these dots represent the high salinity. And when we put the copepods into their high salinity, if they're from the north, they really don't have a big reaction in terms of, of their uh, gene expression changes, which is kind of cool. So they have a low transcriptomic response to high salinity in the north. So some of the take-home messages from this work so far, it's still a little bit of a work in progress. But I found that salinity tolerance and fecundity is higher in the northern population. Transcriptomic response to high salinity is smaller in the northern population. And transcriptomic differences tend to be larger between populations than they do among treatments, salinity treatments. So the next project I'm working on is actually something I started when I was an undergrad here at LSU. And I'm collaborating with um, another student that I met at a meeting a few years ago. And I'm looking at the effects of ocean acidification on a sponge coral species interaction. 
So in a healthy reef, there are two processes, accretion and erosion. And usually, they're balanced. So that means that organisms like corals and bivalves are constantly creating these big physical 3D structures by accreting, accreting calcium carbonate. They make these reefs. Um, but there are other organisms on the reef, like sponges and some bivalves, that dissolve calcium carbonate. So they're constantly kind of in competition. But on a healthy reef, you see a nice balance, and you get this really complex uh, 3D structure on the reef, lots of nooks and crannies, lots of places for critters to hide and live in. But because we're putting a lot of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, we're seeing a change in our ocean environment. So this graph is showing the increase in the concentration of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere over the last 50 years. And as a consequence of this, um, the oceans are actually absorbing a huge proportion of that atmospheric CO2. So we also see an increase in the amount of dissolved CO2 in seawater. And because the concentration of CO2 is increasing in the water, we get a decrease in ocean pH. So the oceans are becoming more acidic. This is changing the entire kind of chemical composition of seawater, and it's making it a lot harder for organisms like corals, um, crustaceans, mollusks, oysters, anything that grows a shell or a skeleton to survive. They're basically dissolving um, in the ocean. So specifically, I wanted to look at how sponges uh, bioerode when pH is low. Do they change their rates of bioerosion? Does ocean acidification affect how a coral calcifies, whether it increases or decreases calcification rates? And then I also wanted to understand the relationship between the sponge and coral when they're found in an acidified environment. So I conducted this research um, at the Smithsonian Tropical Research Institute in Bocas del Toro, Panama. So here's Panama on the map. Bocas del Toro is a small archipelago at the very northern end of the country. And I went down to Bocas two summers ago now, um, and I spent the summer there performing the experiments for this project. This is a picture of the Bocas del Toro Marine Station. And I wrote and received funding from the, from the Smithsonian Tropical Research Institute called STRI. Um, I got a short-term fellowship to do this research. And I mentioned before, I'm doing this in collaboration with a student I met at a meeting. So this is uh, the sponge and the coral that we're specifically working on. This is Cleona variant, this kind of lumpy mass is the sponge. This is Pyrites furcata. It's a uh, finger tip coral, so it kind of has these small branches. And this is actually a fire coral, which we tried to avoid because it's really painful if you come into contact with them. So for our experimental design, we basically went out and sampled the sponge and the coral. We broke them up into fragments. We glued the coral to little microscope slides with a number so we could keep track of who was who. And then we placed these fragments into different treatments. So each of these black boxes represents a small uh, tank. And then the C represents a coral, and an S represents a sponge. So we had treatments where the coral was in isolation, either in an ambient pH or a low pH, which is acidified water. The same with the sponge. And then we also had treatments where the sponge and the coral were joined together with a zip tie. And that's pictured here. So you can see here's a piece of the sponge. Here's a coral, which is not very happy. It's putting the leaves of polyps. And then this is just a zip tie and its label. And then we um, measure changes in the, the sponge and the, the coral, physical changes in their skeletons. And then I took samples for transcript and this data. This is another picture of the setup. So each one of these blue barrels contains water that's being pumped in from the bay right behind the wet lab. And these oil, big orange canisters in the background are actually CO2 tanks. So in order to get the acidified water we needed for some of the treatments, we would bubble in carbon dioxide gas into these blue barrels. That would lower the pH. And then that water would be pumped into each one of these little tanks where our coral and sponge replicates live. So these are some of the changes that we saw um, in terms of the physical morphology. These are just um, regular photographs of coral skeletons. These are SEM photos. This coral was in ambient water, and you don't really see any changes in the skeleton. These two corals were kept in low pH water, and you can see these big divots taken out. Those are the places where the sponge had attached and had started to bioerode 
the calcium carbonate skeleton of the coral. So the transcriptomic results for this project are still pending. After I did the project in Bocas del Toro, I came back, had to finish up my PhD. This kind of went on the back burner for a while. But I recently got all of the libraries ready. I performed the sequencing, and I just got data back on Monday, which I'm really excited to start diving into. But I thought that this would be a cool opportunity to talk a little bit about how data collection and generation has changed since I've been at LSU, particularly for transcriptomics and genomic fields. So some of you may have heard of the term big data. And that basically just is describing any data set that's so large or complex that our normal ways of analyzing it or manipulating it are inadequate. And genomics is a big data science. So this is the headline from a paper published in the journal PLOS Biology a couple of months ago, where the authors compared genomic data production to other big data disciplines like Facebook, Twitter, and astronomy. And they found that the amount of genomic data we're producing every year is growing as fast or faster than these other disciplines. So we're producing more sequence data than there are tweets being posted to Twitter every year globally, which is pretty amazing. And so what this means for biologists who are working with these data is that we need to acquire some kind of computational and bioinformatics skills in order to work with these data. I got into biology because I really love to be outside. I like to be in the ocean. I like dealing with animals. And it was kind of unexpected that I'd have to develop this suite of skills. But it's been a challenge, and it's been really rewarding. And um, if you can get involved in this now, um, it'd be great to start learning while the field is developing. So to give you some characteristics of the data that I collected for this sponge coral project, I ended up sequencing 1.4 billion sequences, which ended up being over 2 billion base pairs. The file sizes were almost 100 gigs, and it took me more than five hours to download it to my computer. So these data sets are huge. And this is actually the project that I'm working on is really not that big. People are collecting data on a, on a scale 10 times as big as this. So to compare that to the data I collected for my PhD here at LSU, I collected about 1,200 sequences and about 400,000 base pairs. So the, the magnitude of change has just been astounding and exciting. So some of the challenges associated with uh, analyzing big data come into kind of categories like visualization, storage, and transfer, and analysis. So these data files are so large that I cannot physically open them with any programs on my computer. I can't open them using like an Excel spreadsheet. I can't open them in Text Wrangler. So I have to do the analyses and the manipulation using other methods. Storage and transfer can be a challenge because you don't want hundreds of gigs of data on your personal laptop. It's going to take up all the space. And then in terms of transfer and analysis, so all the analyses that I'm doing are taking place on a high-performance computing cluster that's remotely. It's not like located in my lab. It's Well, it's actually on campus at LSU, but you could connect to or log into a supercomputer anywhere in the world to analyze your data. And in order to communicate with those resources, we need to be able to use something like a terminal window, where instead of using a program where you're clicking on boxes and using drop-down menus and that sort of thing, interacting with a graphical user interface, you're actually using computer code to communicate with the cluster, telling it what you want to do, how you want to analyze your data. And that's been a big challenge. That's not something that I expected to have to get into when I started graduate school, but that's, that's where the field is today. And it's it's been an exciting challenge to try to learn some of these things. Frustrating, but exciting. So with the last few minutes I have, I thought I would talk about my life uh, as a postdoc and my career path so far. I got my undergrad at Indiana University. I knew that I wanted to do something in biology, but I wasn't quite sure what. And then once I got closer to graduation, I thought, oh my goodness, what am I going to do? So I ended up doing an internship for a year at Moat Marine Lab in Sarasota, Florida. And this was a really great experience for me. I got exposed to different lab work, different field work. And my advisor at Moat, um, one of his collaborators, was taking graduate students. And so I decided to apply to graduate school for my master's. I did my master's at Nova Southeastern University in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. And that's when I started working on sponges for the first time and kind of got um, devoted to this world of population genetics, ecology, and evolution in marine invertebrates. 
when I was at Nova, I was reading a lot of papers by this guy, Mike Helberg, and I thought, he sounds pretty cool. He does a lot of cool work. So I emailed him and said, do you have space in your lab? And he said yes, and so I applied, and that's how I came to LSU. So I did my, uh, my PhD with Mike Helberg at LSU working on sponges, and then I stayed here for my postdoc with Morgan Kelly, and I just talked about the work that I've done with her. The next step is a little bit up in the air. Um, my ultimate career goal is to have a tenure track faculty position, to have a lab, do research, teach and mentor students. But when and where that will happen, I'm not sure yet. So the tenure track um, tends to be a pretty popular one. Oh, sorry, I got ahead of myself. <laughs> so what is life like as a postdoctoral scholar? So a postdoc is basically an individual who has a PhD, uh, you're engaged in a temporary period of research, you have an advisor who kind of guides you and monitors you, and you're trying to learn more skills that you need to be successful in whatever career you choose. And they typically last between one and three years, and in the life sciences, at least these days, it's not unusual to do more than one postdoc. So life as a postdoc is, uh, it has its ups and downs, but mostly it's pretty good. In terms of research, you may be working on a project that is specific to your advisor's research program. So the T. Griopis work I'm doing is part of the broader research program of Dr. Kelly's lab. But that sponge coral project is something that I've developed on my own. You might have teaching responsibilities. I don't, so I don't have to teach. My main focus is research, but I am involved in mentoring the undergrads that are in my lab. Funding and salary is kind of dependent on your position. Funding may come from your advisor. If you're lucky enough to write a fellowship and get your own funding, that's awesome because it gives you independence um, and it kind of demonstrates your track record of, get, of getting funding and that's uh, really important if you, if you want a job in academia. Salary varies between $35,000 and $50,000 depending on your position, your experience, and that sort of thing. And then in terms of career options, you could work uh, for the government, you could work for a non governmental organization, a nonprofit, you could work in industry. And I think a lot of people end up, like me, on the tenure, tenure track looking for um, a position as a professor. And given how competitive that is, I kind of wanted to give you a stat, and I don't want to depress you, but this is something that I think is important to be aware of, and then you can make your decisions accordingly. So this is a graph published a couple of years ago in Nature Biotechnology. The year the years are going up on the uh, x-axis, and this is just a cumulative or an annual number on the y. And so this blue line represents the number of PhD students that are graduating with their degree every year. And then this orange line is showing the number of faculty positions that are available each year. So based on these numbers, only about 10% of PhDs who graduate each year end up in a faculty position. And this does not mean that every PhD wants a faculty position. There are tons of other career options. But if you choose the tenure track, it's competitive. And I think that uh, it's just important to keep those sorts of things in mind, your career prospects, so you can decide what sort of compromises you're willing to make or not willing to make for your career. And then given how um, competitive it can be to get a job in any field, I thought I'd give some advice, things that I've learned that have hopefully led to my success in grad school and beyond. So the first is to publish a lot of papers. You need to have a good balance of quality and quantity, but that's one of the first things people look for is how many papers have you published and what sort of journals are they in. Being able to secure your own funding is great. You can start doing this as a graduate student. I got a lot of little grants, $500 here, $300 here. And then the grant that I got from the Smithsonian was a couple thousand. So if you can secure funding as a grad student, if you can write a fellowship to get funding for your postdoc research, that's awesome. Find mentors and ask questions. There's really no guidebook on how to get into graduate school. And a lot of times I felt confused and frustrated. And so having mentors who can guide you and answer your questions are great. I put my email address up here. If you're at all interested in the things I talked about today, please feel free to email me. Conferences and networking are awesome opportunities to practice talking about your research, to get out there, meet the people in your field. The reason why I got involved with the Sponge Coral Project and got to go down and spend two months living in Panama for the summer was because I met my friend Amber at a conference. 
Um, outreach is important. You need to have a little bit of outreach to show you're kind of giving back to your, to your scientific community. The outreach that I'm involved in, I volunteer for the LSU Environmenters Program, which is a ton of fun, and anybody in this room could be involved in that too if you want. It's open to graduate students and undergrads at LSU. And um, I also write for um, a science blog called The Molecular Ecologist. So that's been a good way to kind of market myself and get my name out there so people learn who I am and what kind of research I do. And then finally, this one might be silly, but be nice. Science is a really small world, and I'm sure you've heard the term six degrees of separation. In science, it's like two degrees of separation. And in marine science, it's like half a degree of separation. And when you're going for a job, whether you're applying for a faculty position, or you're applying for an internship, or you're applying to be in someone's lab for graduate school, obviously people want to hire bright people who have great ideas and a lot of scientific experience and knowledge, but they are also hiring someone who's going to be a member of their lab or a member of their department in their community. And so, um, you know, just try to be nice and be a productive member of, of the community. And with that, I'd like to acknowledge the Kelly Lab, the students that have helped me with my research, my funding sources, and collaborators. And I'm happy to take any questions. Any questions at all, you could ask me about my research, you could ask me about graduate school, you could ask me about postdocs. Yes? So the copepods, we, we, well, when I was sampling in the field or when we're doing experiments with them? So when we're doing experiments with them, we basically use tiny little pipettes and we can just suck up individuals one by one. And so the males and females have a little bit of a size difference. You can tell them apart that way. And then they also do this thing called mate guarding, where the males will grab onto an immature female and hold on to her, basically. I think uh, I might have a, oh, I cut it out. I thought I had a picture of it. Um, so the males have hold on to the female until she's mature. She undergoes her final molt. They mate with each other, and then they separate and she stores the sperm, and she uses that for every one of her subsequent reproductive efforts. So if you can collect mate-guarded pairs, you can pull them apart, you know that you've got a virgin female, and then you can pair her up with different males in order to cross different families and that sort of thing. So it's a lot of work under the light microscope with really small little glass pipettes, and you just kind of have to practice get, getting used to sucking up individuals and transferring them among, among uh, containers. Other, other questions? So, so Melissa, on the, the salinity data, uh -huh. were you running those trials at the, at the same temperature for both the northern and southern populations, or were, or were they in their ambient temperatures? They, they, were in, they were in ambient temperature. So that's one of the tricky things. Salinity and temperature are probably interacting with each other, because usually when you end up in a high salinity situation, it's because the water's warmed up and evaporated. So that would definitely be um, kind of the next step is to combine stressors and see what happens when you have multiple stressors interacting. So not only temperature and salinity in isolation, but temperature and salinity at the same time. And that's something else that I'd like to do with that um, ocean acidification project because your water is acidifying, but it's also warming up. So you've got multiple stressors interacting at the same time, which just makes it more complicated. So um, I, I took my copepods, I isolated the RNA using the kit, a standard hygiene kit, and I, well, yeah, it was a hygiene kit, and then I used New England Biolabs library prep kit. I used RNA-seq kind of protocol, and so you just generate those libraries, stick on some adapters, and I did all of my sequencing at the uh, Illinois genomics facility, who've been super helpful. No, so um, w one of the yeah one of the things that I wanted to mention that I forgot. Thank you for reminding me of a lot. So we have these incredible ways of generating data now, and our analysis is kind of lagging behind. So 
I didn't use, so Genius is a program that you can use to align sequences. Starbeast is a program that you can use to build phylogenetic trees. And those are sorts of questions that I'm interested in, but I didn't necessarily use those analysis for, for this. So here I'm using a lot of R code and a lot of R packages that other people have written. Um, so our analysis methods are kind of lagging behind. So I think Genius has plugins now you can use for next gen data, but I know like the Beast software package is still kind of lagging behind on the number of sequences you can input before it just crashes. Okay, uh, let's move on to our next speaker.